Yes, please. Okay. All right. Adam, so, hello. Uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you for, you know, first of all, for, I, uh, we go back now a little ways and, um, you know, being that you're uh, such a film historian and a lover of film history. Yes. Uh, this just seemed like the natural thing to invite you to do this with me because, uh, you know, I feel like I have, I, I've, you're, it's so rare to meet people who are, have the same common love of film history, you know. I, I'm thrilled and there's, there's nothing, for me, there's nothing more exciting than getting a great, uh, you know, movie book to read. Now, I always judge a book, I don't know about you, by, the cover? by how many times I've dog-eared the pages, I, I, you know, so I would count here that there must be 20 times that I've dog-eared the pages. I'm surprised you dog ear Ileana, because it seems to me you're so, uh, you love books. You, you, you know, we both got a copy uh, sent to us. So, but it, I would imagine you like to keep yours in such pristine condition, but that's another topic. Well, because our, our compulsions. Going, there's kind of, you know, memorable, I mean, the, the, you know, listen, Scott is such a brilliant writer that one of the things I was going to ask him about is his process. Because when a person, you know, researches, you research, you gather information, anecdotes, but you have to put it in some cohesive order that, so that it's not, and then he did this, and then he did this, and then he did it's this. It's just a so chronology, often. right? It's not, it's not a laundry list. It's, exactly. And so right. sometimes the ascent is much more interesting than the eventual descent. But I think that this idea, first of all, the title is perfect, A Brilliant Disguise. But um, I love this sentence. It was a brilliant disguise. He could present himself as Cary Grant at will. And because his audience found him to be more or less like his screen self, they relaxed and took him at face value without bothering to wonder about his affinity for and sympathy with other people's emotional distress. I think that is like, just that's it in, an, in a nutshell. But there's also so many uh, revelations. For me, the biggest being, I always knew about his flirtation with uh, LSD, but he was like a tripper. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... he tripped like, He's like, I think I'll go trip out on acid one more time. I mean, he's beating Dennis Hopper in that department. <laughs> I like how you tied it to your book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hadn't uh, thought of that. Humble brag. <laughs> um, I was just setting this up because Scott's going to join us in a, in a minute. But yes. when, uh, what do you uh, think? What do you think? I loved it too. Uh, I was so excited. Scott is. Um, you know, he is, I think, at the pinnacle of, of Hollywood biographies, biographers, you know. But um, uh, I um, thought the title, to me, I initially interpreted that it was probably going to be about his ambivalence, his sexual ambivalence, yes. uh, you know, by Brilliant Disguise, that is this idea of closeting, you know. Uh, and it, it's, it turns out it really, it's not about that. It's really about more of this sort of internal psychological bifurcation between his, the Archie Leach, the Archibald Leach and the Cary Grant per, per, persona or, right. you know, uh, artifice to some degree. Um, and I think like uh, you will bring it up. We'll talk about it obviously in a couple of minutes, but uh, you know, I was wondering if the LSD is, was in a way to kind of fuse those things and the psych, psychic healing that he he was after all his life you know um it's a, he, I, he's a lot more complicated a guy than i knew about the book is great at at illustrating that obviously struggle. and uh yeah. uh another example of that which happens which he writes about in the book which becomes apparent and has happened to so many other stars you know marlon brando betty davis is they sort of become an amalgamation of certain right. parts that they have played that have gone over well uh, with audiences. And you wonder, is that just something habitual or is it something you lean into because the audiences love that character so much and you can launch into it and launch out of it at, at, at will, you know? And I, and I think that then 
as the book describes as he gets into his later life, which is his 60s, and he's, he starts wearing caftans, and I was like, where, this is incredible. So it does not have a dull third act, you know, it is, it takes another great, great turn. And I also think his mentorship, I was very, very touched by his mentor, mentorship of some of the people he met along the way when he got, um, you know, when he, when he got older. And, and of course, there's some great anecdotes. The, the story of, which I'd heard before, he had the bungalow next to Mel Brooks. And at first, Mel Brooks is like, can't, can't believe Cary Grant wants to have lunch with him. And he picks up the check. And then every day he'd see Cary Grant and he'd, pick, he'd have to pick up the check. And by the end of the week, he tells the secretary of Cary Grant, calls on me, just say, I'm not in. <laughs> we'll have to get into his notorious, pardon the, the pun, uh, uh, stinginess too. Should we bring yeah. Scott Scott on? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm just so excited to uh, have him get a glimpse into okay. our impressions of the book. There he is, Scott Iman. The name of the book is Cary Grant, Brilliant Disguise, available where books are sold. Uh, Simon Schuster. How many? How many does this make, Scott? That's fifteen. Wow. But who's counting? <laughs> That is impressive. Thank you. The uh, uh, you're in West Palm Beach. We 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 know. Yep. Have been for twenty, almost thirty years. Wow. You were and the house is paid for. That's why we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's nowhere to go anymore. No mortgages. No. I'm I'm yeah. all set for for you know we were talking. I'm all set for uh, early bird specials actually. You know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ready emotionally, physically. I don't know if my digestive tract is ready, but emotionally I'm ready. Gotcha. Uh, you guys know each other from, uh, from TCM. I, I, yes. I the TCM that was cruise. From the TCM and the festival, cruise. And the festivals. Yeah. Did you go, Scott, were you going as a fan or were you interviewed for your, a project that you would, yes. one of your books? Both, both. Uh, the first couple of times I went uh, to cover it uh, journalistically. Uh, and then the last couple times I was I was a guest. It was fun. It it's was pretty, fun. Pretty COVID it's cruises. Yeah. Well. Um, hey Scott, I wanted to ask a question just because we were talking. I don't know if you got to overhear us it, it, talking about your people's impressions of the book. And one of the things we were talking about is that. You, you, you think the revelation is going to be kind of about his fluid sexuality, but for me, really, the rep, some of the revelations were just the, uh, the incredible poverty that he rose out of, the circumstances that he rose out of, creating this character of Cary Grant, and then spending the rest of his life trying to merge Archie Leach and Cary Grant. I was not prepared for how challenging that was for him. Yeah, well, as far as his sex life is concerned, the most interesting thing about a biographical subject is his sex life, you're in big trouble. As a writer, you're uh -huh. in big trouble because really, there's really not that much to it. It's, it's not sufficiently interesting. His psychological displacement is, is I think, fascinating because uh, I think it's all of a piece. I don't think you can separate his psychological displacement from all the other displacements he had. It's right. all one. You right. Know? So As he the was sexual trying, side would be, right? He was trying to integrate two very disparate personalities, one intrinsic and one learned. And I sound like a shrink. And, and that's, that's extremely difficult. That's extremely difficult because one is innate and one is not. One is, one is essentially performance, you know? Uh, so Brilliant Disguise refers to the act of being Cary Grant, actually. And all that that encompasses. Yes. Right. There's no, I mean, you, exactly. I think if, if the thing that most people have been stuck on the last bunch of years is, is this, uh, his, his uh, sexual identity. And uh, right, it, like everything else in his life, it's, it's, uh, it's caught in a, a bit of a, it's bound to be caught a bit in, a, in this struggle, internal uh -huh. struggle that he, uh -huh. that he had. Um, uh, but uh, he oh, chose. 
he he chose i mean the uh the first revelation in the book is that he meets douglas fairbanks mm -hmm. and so then you you suddenly say aha i see that i see a little bit of douglas fairbanks that's the first brick in kind of his you know persona is yeah. douglas fairbanks a sense of dash theatrical dash which he, which he demonstrates both in a swashbuckler essentially like Gunga Din. Also, but it also becomes part and parcel of his romantic image, you know? Uh, and, and of course the physicality with, with, with which Grant approaches comedy far more than drama, but, his, his, but especially in comedy, his physicality, which is one of the most remarkable things about him, which stems from his control of his body, which he learned as, a, as an acrobat, as a young man. Yes. And, and then he go and then the next phase of his life, which is I didn't realize how early he came to New York, how early that he left. He uh, was born in Bristol. How, how early he left and came to America, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a movie in itself. You his could, early days living in Greenwich Village with Ori Kelly. The interesting thing about him, actually, for me, one of the interesting things about him was how self determined he was from a very early age that diary he keeps when he's 14, when he's cutting school right and left and just going and roaming as he puts it roaming. And he's going to music hall and going to the movies. And he's already kind of narrowing his focus to the theater, you know, to a theatrical life. And, 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 and he, he gets himself apprenticed to the Pender troupe, uh, drags his father into signing off on him because he's a minor uh, and then dumps the Pender troupe. Uh, <laughs> In, and keeps the money that Pender advances him for his uh, his voyage back to England, and he keeps the money and sets himself up in New York City. I mean, he really is kind of operating in a kind of Oliver Twist, well, more like Fagin, actually, because he's maneuvering and he's taking advantage of people in all sorts of little small ways. Yeah, and he's building uh, the slowly, incrementally, the blocks of a career. You know, even though I don't think at that point he had a real strong image of where he was going. I think he was determining, he, what was motivating him was what he was leaving more than where he was going. Because I don't think it, his, his, his vision of his career became clear until fairly later in the twenties when he makes the leap from vaudeville to the Schubert organization, which is a huge leap. Yeah, and again, you get glimpses. I mean, of, uh, you know, you don't quite, and then it makes me want to read Ori Kelly's book, but mm -hmm. you get glimpses of how much did Ori Kelly then contribute to his persona, uh, clothing, again, sense of style, um, entree to other, to meeting people, et cetera. Yeah, 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 yeah. And no, it's, very, it's a very interesting uh, uh, trajectory. And the problem, of course, is, is it, it, you, you asked about how I work, my working methods. And it's kind yeah. of interesting because uh, I know a lot of other uh, uh, biographers and people who write books and nobody else works like I do and I may, I'm probably doing something wrong because I have a friend who's a very good biographer and he does all of his research and he puts them in folders chapter one chapter two chapter three and once his research is complete he opens chapter one and starts writing and he goes on through till chapter 25 and the book's over and I can't do that it would bore me to tears I mean I it would I, find, I would find it stupefying I hop around Basically what I'm looking for is something that's interesting. Stanley Kubrick, mm -hmm. actors would do it slow, they do it fast, they do it you know, uh, drunk, they do it sober. And he, they're on take 45 and the actor would say, what is it you want? And Kubrick would say, I want it interesting. And I think that's what motivates me in writing a book. I'm looking for things that are interesting no matter what context they go in and what period they go in. So I hop around, I, I could start a book in the middle and work out like an island, like silt building up, mm -hmm. or I can start at the end and work backwards. Uh, but I always hop around. I never start on page one and go through. I now that means that the writing process is is uh, more fun for me. It makes the rewriting process a lot more work because it's more disorganized. Because when I finish a first draft, I'm much more disorganized than I am if I was working uh, more coherently, starting on page one and going through to page six hundred. But I can't do that because my attention span uh, just won't hold up. That doing. Uh, are you saying that uh, 
sort of let's say your colleague that you were mentioning before, who's more methodical in your words, uh, so they get the idea that the, the sort of the kernel of the book, like for instance, in this case, it's this, as we keep bringing up this kind of bifurcation, his, his psychic you know, struggle, uh, whereas maybe uh, this other writer would have had that idea and then kind of proven it, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas you are going through like an op a discovery in the, through the process of writing. Yeah, and I don't have, I, I almost never have any particular point of view about a subject. I don't have an ax to grind. I don't have a premise that I'm trying to maintain. Uh, I go into it as, as innocently as I can. Now, of course, I've seen a lot of Cary Grant movies before I wanted to do the book. Uh, but it's not like I ever sat down and thought about what Cary Grant would be like to write about. I, I didn't. I don't think like that. I, I, I try to take in my formative movie growing years. I was just ingesting. I was just ingesting personalities and movies and, and images. Uh, and I didn't start writing until I was... My first book, I think, came out when I was 31 or 32. So all those formative teenage years and in the, well into my 20s, I was just a sponge absorbing stuff. It wasn't with the purpose of writing about it one day, although that might have been forming by the time I was in my tw early 20s. Uh, but then, then the process of re-seeing them uh, and you juxtapose what your, what your feelings are as a, a, a mature adult versus what your feeling, feelings about someone were the first time you saw Gunga Din or the first time you saw Notorious or To Catch a Thief. It's a different process, you know, and you're looking more analytically as opposed to just receiving joy. joy. Um, so it's, it's, it's a strange process. It's my process. I don't know that it works for anybody else or should. And I tell kids that come to me and they want to know how you, how you get into a career as a writer. I haven't quite figured that out yet. But there are no rules. I think everybody works differently. I think everybody probably needs to work differently in that they should find out what works for them and follow that, as opposed to simply following, you know, Robert McKee's way to write a screenplay or someone else or a biographer's idea of how to write a biography. I think, I think process is more important than we probably give it credit for being. And I think an artist, a writer, a painter, a, a playwright, whatever, needs to find their process that works for them and which one won't necessarily work for anybody else well what worked for me again as a reader is and i that's what i i these i feel like these little nuggets is that you sort of go off on a sidebar with characters like director leo mccary david niven warren Beatty. you know all along the way you don't lose the narrative thread of Cary Grant, yet it paints a picture of who Cary Grant is meeting mm -hmm. along the way and his impressions of these various people, Doris Day and her husband, Marvin Melcher. You know, they all come back to me now as I'm reading it. That's um, something I do intentionally. What I, I, what I think is important in a biography and what I don't like when it's not done in a biography I'm reading, I want a sense of the family. I want a sense of the interconnections of my subject because I think that tells you a lot about who and what they are, who right. their friends are, what they like to eat, what aftershave they use, what perfume they use, the kind of socks they wear, all that kind of little things. And especially their friendships, their closest friends. Grant's closest friends, closest friend was Clifford Odets in Hollywood. Yeah. That's interesting in and of itself, okay, because Clifford Odets is, is a, an urban Jew. Cary Grant is a lower middle class kid from Bristol, England. They shouldn't really have much in common. So what was it that pulled them together? And what I think it was, was simply both of them shared a basic sense of unhappiness about who and what they were. Odets was essentially dissatisfied with Odets and Grant was essentially dissatisfied with Grant. And, and neither of those positions was uh, uh, could be improved because it was it was it was baked in them at the beginning at the moment of conception and in, in their experiences of life as children mm -hmm. and, and you can try to outrun a miserable childhood and you will fail every time because it can't be done you have to process it and envelop and ingest it inside yourself but you can't outrun it because it's faster than you are and and both of them were trying to outrun miserable childhood it was Clifford miserable uh, parents. 
did Odette start his career very, very young as well, or it, did he start off? I, oh, I know yeah, a bit he was in his late 20s when he hit big. He was a young guy when he hit big. I don't think he was even 30. He might have been 30, but I don't think he was much older than 30 when those, all those, pl those three plays, boom, 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 hit in a row. And he was the, the great white hope of the American theater. Uh, and and, and I, it was hard for him because I think he probably felt like an imposter at the beginning. And then he felt like a pitcher who loses his fastball. <laughs> you know, because as far as New York was concerned, Odets was pouring out in Hollywood. And why isn't he writing great plays? Uh, because he had an expensive lifestyle, because he liked actresses, because there's all sorts of reasons, some good, some not so good. Uh, but he went to Hollywood and then it was harder for him to go back to the theater because the theater is hard to make money in unless you have a hit. And, and as his son, Walt, told me, you know, he spent three years on a play that he made forty five hundred dollars on. Well, you can't support an ex-wife, two children, your own uh, uh, obsession with Paul Clay paintings. You know, that's difficult to do. <laughs> but, you know, you talk about Grant's cheapness. I find that very interesting because he was cheap in expectable ways in ways you'd expect someone who was poor as a child saving rubber bands. Uh, saving socks, you know, things like that. He was cheap about small things. He wasn't cheap about large things. He was always loaning money to Clifford Odets, who always paid it back. Odets was good for it. And I don't think he would have continued loading money to Odets if Odets didn't pay it back, but he did. But I mean, it was considerable that's, amounts of money over the years. Yeah, that's so not uncommon. So he wasn't that... cheap when it came to his friends and people he trusted. You know? Yeah, that's not uncommon. I, I, you know, you, 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 you see that a lot with people that are very stingy. They're willing to make these big, you know, purchases or big loans. But when it comes to the little bits, the little things, they get very, very, uh, very, very uh, stingy about it. Very particular. If you grow up poor, if you grow up and there's no money, well, you know, you always got that in the back of your mind. Things could head south again. Sure, sure. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you got six or eight million dollars in the bank. It's that's a that that's a rational thing. And, and fear of poverty is an irrational thing. And, but it's not irrational because it actually happened to you. So it's always in the back of your mind. If it happened once, it can happen again. You know, sure. Yeah. And it's not uncommon. I mean, Charlie Chaplin was cheap in small ways, too. Uh, and, and Chaplin is is similar to Grant in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, uh, except Chaplin was much worse off as a child than Grant was. Grant never missed a meal. I mean, there was always food on the table. It wasn't very good food, but it, there was all, he always ate and there was a roof over his head. Chaplin had to live in the streets and go to a workhouse and live in a workhouse and it was really grim. Uh, Grant was never in that position, but psychologically and emotionally, they're very similar. But I love creating a sense of the family, not the real family, but the emotional family, which included, you know, uh, uh, Odets and, to an extent, uh, 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 McCary, you know, the people that he worked with that he trusted. Yeah. Hitchcock less so because I don't, I think they trusted each other on one level. On another level, I think they, under, they understood each other on a, like the cellular level because they were both lower middle class kids, English kids of whom nothing was expected. <laughs> and they both fooled everybody. And they also understood, the, uh, each of them understood the other's weaknesses and mm -hmm. strong points. When Hawks... Hmm? Hawks. Hawks. Hawks didn't go around exposing his his weak points or uh, weak points to anybody. Hawks was a, was a, uh, a a fairly armored personality, I think. Uh, but he was the he, nobody had Hawks's skill. No other director I can think of had Hawks's skill set, where you could direct a great western, a great comedy, uh, a good musical. I mean, you know, let's face it, that's a highly unusual skill set. His comedies, I think, are the, be are the best screwball comedies there are, frankly. Definitely. Uh, his, his Girl Friday and Bringing a Baby are miraculous. Yeah. Uh, and, and they just, they never cease to delight me. But you wouldn't expect that guy to be able to do Red River, too. <laughs> but, he, but he could. But he could. I wanted to so go back. Special case. Fox is a special case. I wanted to go back a little bit, you know, to his beginning career and the influence of of may west putting him in the movie and that and that's really where it seems to me all, all, all these pre-movies uh before that he was kind of floundering as a you know romantic lead and well, he was intimidated i think he was intimidated mm -hmm. by the movies number one because he doesn't know 
how to, pre- he, he's, he, he doesn't seem to know what to do, you know, how to project himself into the land, uh, which he certainly learned, but he keeps his hands in his pockets, things like that. Yeah. You know, what do you do with your hands? Well, if you're experienced, you know what to do with your hands. If you don't know what to do with your, if you're not experienced, you put them in your pocket. So he's feeling his way film by film by film. And I think he was terrified of Dietrich. He was terrified of Mae West. He was terrified of Sternberg with good reason. <laughs> Sternberg ate insecure actors for breakfast, lunch and dinner because uh, that was what he did. Uh, but he's very unsure of himself and he's, 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 he's assembling slowly his confidence, his idea of how to present himself, how to, how to respond to the camera, to project into the camera lens so that the, but but at first, I think I see in the book, he's like an eight by 10 glossy. He's just there, but he's not putting anything out because yeah. he doesn't know how. And I think that that translates to fear for an actor. If an actor is not willing to interact and not willing to present personality or the or the or part, then it seems to me that he's terrified. Yeah. Know? I actually thought in the movie, uh, She Done Him Wrong, the Mae West movie, he's better in the scenes without Mae West. Yeah. He's a little bit more natural. Yeah. But those are, those are female vehicles. Yeah. The West pictures and the, and the Dietrich pictures. Those are all, they're not about the leading man. Right. They're passing through. The leading man's passing through. They're, they're a sex object for her to bounce her her one liners off of basically. Yeah. So, and he had to feel, he had to sense that even at this early stage of his development. But then once he gets into the screwball comedies, that that's where he really sort of, that's sort of, persona number one you know the awful truth and then i i I, that's why reading a lot about leo mccary made me understand how much leo mccary may have really influenced his stardom mccary is such an interesting figure i wish somebody would write a book about leo mccary i was actually believe me after the book i said i gotta start reading more about him my god there's not much out there that's why i basically stopped the book for about 12 or 15 pages (laughs) Uh, talk about Leo McCary because there's it, the, the whole thing about my son, John and all that and his career basically destructing, self-destructing uh, and Grant throwing him a lifeline. Yeah. Fair to remember, uh, which was only got made because Grant wanted to do it. Yeah. It's not like there's a lot of other actors they could have gotten to play that part. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's very limited n- repertoire there. Uh, but but McCary's fascinating. But McCary also is distri- self destructive in a way. The Grant never was because whatever Michigas Grant was going through, he made sure that it was Archie Leach's Michigas, and it didn't slide over into to become Cary Grant's Michigas. That mm-hmm. he kept that he kept Cary Grant. He kept the franchise pristine. Archie, it, what, the water might have been in Archie's neck. But Cary Grant, he kept pristine. And that's really difficult to do when you've got the emotional issues and the, and the anxiety issues that he had to not let it slowly be absorbed into your work. And he rarely, rarely did. Rarely did. Um, another revelation for, for me was just his involvement in the British war effort. That, that whole section uh, is, is fascinating. He tried to enlist. Did yeah. he try hard to enlist or? He was, he was all set for the Air Force. He was all set to go to the Air Force when that letter came from the head of RKO, which uh-huh. is so obviously, uh, we'll talk about this when we're alone together kind of letter because he wasn't going to put it in writing that uh, the enlistment in the Air Force really didn't have to happen because there were certain jobs that he, if he might be willing to undertake that he could also have the option of turning down if he didn't want to do them. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that, that would be very helpful. <laughs> You know, it's not like they're talking about a part in a movie or a contract. Clearly, there's something that's going to be dealt with in a personal meeting, you know. And at that point, the the enlistment in the Air Force goes away. And he was due to report after he finished Mr. Lucky, you know, in late 42, early 43. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly all that goes away. And then he starts doing a lot of USO stuff, touring around. Uh, And I think he was doing light reconnaissance. I can't prove it absolutely. But there's no reason for that letter to exist if they hadn't been recruited to be part of, of, of the light reconnaissance that a lot of show business people were doing, that where basically DeMille was running out of his office at Paramount for the FBI. Is it the case that uh, in the last bunch of years, records have been being released or something from the government? Because it seems like um, 
it more and more seems to be coming out about how interconnected well, it, it actually it, was to it's basically efforts. connecting the dots i mean the, i found that letter in grant's papers the letter from the head of rko and i thought well that's interesting now who would know about this because the the main guy in 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 hollywood was demille i've been through demille's papers there's nothing about grant in demille's papers uh in in terms of of his work with the fbi but then i remember then I remember Alexander Corda was in America while all this was going on. And Corda was peripherally involved theoretically in MI6. My friend Alan Rohde happened to have uh, Alexander Corda's FBI file. He sent me Alexander Corda's FBI file, which is just, 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 you could write a, a great documentary just out of Alexander Corda's FBI file because he was prodigiously deceptive, a brilliant liar. And he was carrying dozens of MI6 agents through his London Films Organization for the entire duration of the war and paying them with his money, not MI6's money. Uh, and they were all doing uh, reconnaissance for, you know, for the English and ostensibly for the Allies. And uh, so I think, well, okay, now who's going to know about this? So I called Michael Corda, Alex's nephew, who ran Simon & Schuster for 30 years. And Michael said, well, the funny thing about that is, he said, Alex and Carrie Grant were very good friends and they never worked together. <laughs> and he said, and most of Alex's friends, uh, close friends he had derived from World War II, from his experiences working with uh, MI6 and the, the, the Department of Defense in America and working with the Roosevelt administration because the Roosevelt administration knew what was going on and approved what was going on while Hoover and the FBI skirts were on fire about it because whatever Hoover couldn't control, he wanted to obliterate. So it, you put all these, these uh, 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 things together, and I mean, the picture becomes pretty clear, I think. Yeah, it's a, it's a great section of the book, very, very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Cary Grant is a spy. He'd be a good spy, <laughs> because, because there's certain deviousness in his nature that he could also play on screen. He played deviousness very well. Oh, and Notorious is incredible, you know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Ileana, let me ask you a question. Sure. I see Cary Grant from the outside as a critic. Uh-huh. But you're a trained, wonderful actor. When you watch Cary Grant, what do you see as an actor looking at another actor? Well, for me, as a, you know, it's not only as, a, as an actor, but as a woman, you know, the reason that I find him so attractive is in is in movies specifically like Charade, you know, even though he was a lot older then, um, is that he has a gentle, you know, that he's he's got a great sense of humor, he's impeccably dressed, he's a gentleman, and he represents a kind of a man that no longer exists that I'm fascinated with, that people think, oh, they can't be Cary Grant, and yet he kind of invented himself. So anybody could be Cary Grant if they really, if they really tried. But I think he's an incredible actor. I mean, I think Notorious is probably my favorite Cary Grant movie. And then a movie like Arsenic and Old Lace, even though it's, you know, he thinks it's over the top. He totally, he gets away with it. He does, he does. You know, because he totally commits. And that may go back to his being a, an acrobat, acrobat circus performer, he completely commits. Yeah. And then I'm skipping ahead to a movie like Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House with, you know, which my, my grandfather was in. And yeah. one of the things my grandmother said is, you know, he didn't have a bad angle. Yeah. But there was a complete sense of relaxation huh? that he was never going to look bad on camera and so he could go a little bit further with the camera but I think that one of my favorite things that he does which is in like blandings is he his great sense of irritation and he's an incredible listener mm -hmm. you know you can watch him listen and make these faces and cock his head and I think that that is nobody else does that yeah. so he has a certain you know, whereas maybe Jimmy Stewart has a certain verbal dexterity rhythm that's funny. Cary Grant is an incredible listener and he has a stillness about him when he listens. A focus. 
Yeah, that is very, very funny. I mean, I think he's an incredible actor, not early on, but I think that later on. And again, in, you know, when you in North by North by Northwest, but again, even though it's a slight movie charade, he's so deadpan. You know, there's the scene towards the end of charade where Audrey Hepburn comes, she finally discovers Right, right. Who he is, and she makes the appointment at the very end of the movie, and they open the door, and he's just sitting there. Hello. You know, and, and like, with just one, just with his presence, he manages to convey something. Yeah. What um, you said about him committing in our second always, that's interesting. I wonder, I, you're right. I hadn't thought of that. I wish I had. I wish I'd asked you this before I wrote the book. <laughs> but I wonder if that comes from working as an acrobat, because if you're working as an acrobat, you yeah. can't be worried that the guy's going to drop you. It cannot enter your mind right. that right. you might get dropped and get hurt because then you'll be you'll hold back and you it's won't you, you'll be you'll be preoccupied right. and you can't do the routine. Right. You have to believe it's all going to work out and commit totally to the triple somersault or whatever it is you're doing. And I wonder if that suspension of disbelief for the performer it comes from his his physical his background and physical physical behavior i think it does this this, this may be that, that i mean when you there's a beginning you know the very beginning of mr blandings when they're in the cramped new york apartment yeah Myrna loy is asleep and he reaches in the closet and puts on her pinwad by accident right 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 <laughs> you know that's commitment mm -hmm. he's not looking at he never he's never sort of you know winking at the camera he just has total confidence in himself yeah um yeah. and in his comedy and that must have come from somewhere from from knowing that that was going to get a laugh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that physicality that physicality sets him apart i don't think anybody had the physicality that he had. He also had a great, I think, ability to use his eyes on camera, you know, not blink, and be very secure with looking someone right in the eye. And I, and I, and I read in the book that he told someone, he gave that acting advice to huh? always look someone in the eye when they were, when you were acting with him. Right, right, right. Also, right. he's got, yeah. he's got, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Go on, go on. Sorry. What is that? Whether he was on camera or not, which looking in the eye. I mean, it just because it. I could understand why that would be important, whether or not the camera sees it or not. Well, that's your... that's that you have to do that for the other actor. That's part sure. of the, yeah. the teamwork aspect of acting. Sure. You have to you have to look the other actor dead in dead in the eye. Uh, but you're right. He does. He he commits totally. But he also has that confidence to not laugh at his own jokes. That was going to say. You never catch. A grant in a grant comedy, he's not amused particularly. He's struggling to maintain his dignity. He's struggling to maintain his equilibrium. The character he and he's not. And there are comedians who who who, who do that. Who will laugh at their own jokes or you know uh, uh, let you know that they're amused by by being amusing in grant that way, like they're that. winking at the he camera. Keeps it very very level and intent. Uh, when he's doing a comedy, he doesn't gag it up. In other words, it lets the audience know that it's a comedy. The right. comedy comes from the situations and the character. It doesn't come from the actors uh, uh, signaling to the audience. Yeah. So he seemed to figure out something that, you know, decades later, comedians love to talk about, which is the idea of, or comic actors love to talk about, which is the, you know, play comedy straight, just as you would drama. Um, you know, the moment right. you start, you know, yeah. Um, and he, so he had this information that uh, he 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 uh, clearly was uh, tapped into, you know, about playing his uh, taking it seriously, uh, and also uh, he would look foolish. I mean, uh, was it at the end of uh, Holiday, right, where he's doing pratfalls, but um, yeah. you know he lands on his butt, you know, and he's perfectly happy to look ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? That's a self. That's a, also someone who's very secure as an actor. Yeah, and also, but when Cary Grant lands in his butt, a slight lock of hair will come down over his forehead. That's the <laughs> only sense of displacement that happens. It's not like he falling, he's falling into a bat of flour. 
That's, and that's as he said, point. like your grandmother said, there are no bad angles. The lock of hair falling down over his forehead just makes him sexier. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the another great in some of the in some of the movie he never worked with Billy Wilder. He kept turning him down. He turned down. He turned down Sabrina. He mm-hmm. turned down Love in the Afternoon. He turned down One Two Three. Uh, and it drove Wilder nuts. It drove Wilder nuts because, I mean, let's face it, Sabrina and Love in the Afternoon are slam dunks for Gary Grant. He, I mean, you're not mentioning Some Like It Hot, where Tony Curtis essentially... <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, the yeah they're, they're was back. that his revenge? That Probably. It probably in some subtle way, yes. But it drove Wilder nuts. But I think it was simply that he had such a terrible experience with Michael Curtiz... <laughs> That, and now Curtiz was Hungarian and Wilder's Austrian, but they're very close. I mean, they're right next to each other, you know, in, in Europe. So, and they both have accents and Wilder was not nasty, but he had sharp elbows. You know, he could be sarcastic. And I just think, I think Grant, after that horrible experience with, with Curtiz, was going to avoid European directors because they yelled, you know, and he didn't, he didn't work for Otto Preminger either. <laughs> but then a lot of people did work for Otto Preminger. Uh, but no, he turned down Wilder consistently, and there's no rational reason for it because those those are great parts for him to play. Yeah, he would have been amazing. There's no rational reason for him, except it was Wilder. There was something about Wilder that put him off. I guess, well, you know, this the this sense that he liked to improvise, which again, you know, this is this revelation I had, you know, in talking to my grandfather too. We had this idea that you know people wrote the script and the actors delivered the lines, but there was great deal of improvisation in these comedies and rewrites and people coming up with things on the fly. And well, with that, comedy, you can't tell it's going to work until you yeah. really get it on its feet, get the scenes on its feet. And if it seems a little flat, then what do you do? You, you try to make it better, you know? So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when you've already established, by the time he he's working with on Mr. Blandings with your grandfather, uh, the audience has certain expectations. So in Mr. Blanding's, the comedy happens around him. His reactions are the joke, you know. Uh, everybody, all the rustics, the, all the, like right out of Shakespeare, all the rustics, the guys that are the construction people, the foreman, who are just costing him money. He's just seeing dollar signs everywhere he looks. Uh, and he's frozen in place, but with horror, that it's the same way he reacts to Hepburn and bringing up baby. He's frozen in horror. He can't escape. He's in too deep. And yeah. frust- Cary Grant frustrated is just delicious. It's just delicious. Yeah, it's interesting because when Bogdanovich does What's Up Doc with Ryan O'Neill, mm-hmm. you know, and I love What's Up Doc, but the one thing he misses with Cary Grant is that the irritation isn't quite there. When he, in Blandings, when he discovers that he's moved to the country and Myrna Loy has read the train schedule wrong, and he's going to have to get up at five o'clock in the morning. That's my favorite scene in the movie. It's, yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Dismay. Deep, deep dismay. You know, and he, the- he goes through the whole, and the, and, and, <laughs> you know, and his rage towards her, which, you know, made me think in reading the book that some of that is real because this irritation towards his wives that wouldn't do exactly the way what he wanted them to do. Right, right. Uh, is so funny and so very relatable. Funny. Very funny, very funny. You know, so he's, he, but his skill set was so extreme in comedy. He could do pratfalls and physical things, and he could also do the comedy of frustration, like Oliver Hardy staring at the camera. All right. Over, you know where the where the where the point is not blowing up. The point the point is just letting the audience see you seething. That's the funny part. He could do. The hundred, the full three hundred and sixty of of frustration and comedy. Yes. Now, one funny one, and I've told, said this before many times, is uh, my my grandfather obviously was a liberal, and so was Merloy, and they were very heavily involved in liberal politics. Yeah. And uh, my grandfather said that whenever he and Merloy would talk politics, Cary Grant would excuse himself and go get a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd leave. So he was. He said he was a very cautious man, and that's probably yeah. the longevity of his career. Yeah. Well, he, there were very, there are very few films where he's stepping out of his niche. Yeah. You know, and I, I I spent a fair amount of time talking about the films he turned down, the movies he didn't make that he could have made, like Star Is Born, like The Third Man, 
Yeah. Well, even if you just add those two five titles, it's a different career. It's a totally different career. And, and we wouldn't be mostly talking about Cary Grant as uh, a, a great comedian, a prodigiously gifted comedian, uh, although he's very good in drama too, but that's basically limited to three or four pictures, Notorious, uh, None But The Lonely Heart, Any Serenade, one or two others. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. The rest of his dramas aren't, aren't that particularly interesting. Although one I like, which is a little, it's off the beaten path, and you mentioned it briefly. I do like this movie called In Name Only. Yeah. I, it's kind of an interesting movie. It is. One of his more serious, if people are looking for something where it's not a, a, a comedy, uh, it doesn't quite work, but I do think if it's interesting and him with Carol Lombard is interesting. It's an interesting movie because it's essentially about a duel between two women. Yeah, you know, Kate, he, the, Kate Francis and Carol Lombard are fighting over him, and it, you know who's going to get him. Uh, and he's kind of in the middle, you know. And he's 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 not really taking control of the situation or the movie because it's not written for him. It's right. basically written as a woman's picture, quote unquote. It seems to me, and that's yeah. about the last time he did that. You know, <laughs> appeared in a woman's picture because they have better parts. They have more. They have more anger, and he's more passive. His character is more passive. Right. Um, I'm going to be committed to try to watch uh, None But the Lonely Heart. And then that's one of those movies like The Good Earth. I think I've tried, <laughs> you know, I, I, like I've tried diligently over my entire movie going career. Like today's going to be the day I'm going to watch The Good Earth. So I'm going to give, I, I always sort of bristle a little bit at Ethel Barrymore, but I'm, I'm excited to, to, to watch it again. Yeah. I, 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 it, it's not a great picture. But I think it's underrated. I, yeah. I, 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 the audacity of it, you know, in 1944 when everybody's making, uh, you know, hortatory, well, let's kill the Japs movies and the triumph of the Western democracy and everybody's, you know, going bravely to their doom uh, in the Xanax Purple Heart, you know, the, all, all this horrible flag waving jingoistic thing. Here's this movie that dares to suggest we're screwed. We're not, even if we get out of this alive, it's going to be different and it's not going to be better. Well, yeah. so it works as an artifact. Is it? Oh, yeah. And I think, yeah. I, I think the relationship between Grant and Ethel Barrymore is as close as he ever got to, to, to analyzing the relationship between Archie and, her mo and his mother, yeah. which was catastrophic in every, every possible respect. Uh, and it had to be very, very difficult for him to come to, to come to that point where he was willing to do that, you know, because he spent most of his life devising this carapace that he could play, the carry carapace. Uh, and here he is basically exposing his ambivalence, his inability to satisfy his mother, his mother's inability to satisfy him. And he's actually going there, you know, and it's fascinating if you know anything at all about Cary Grant. And I think the picture works better than its reputation would indicate. It's too long, admittedly. It does go on and uh, too long, but, and Odets is not a natural filmmaker, uh, but it's still, I, I still, I still like the picture. I like the picture the first time I saw it years ago before I thought of writing the book. And I like it even more now because I see more things in it. Yeah. When, when viewed through the prism of Archie and Carrie. Yeah, no, I'm excited to take a look at it. It's one of the it's first. Better than the good earth. I can, I can assure you it's better <laughs> than the good earth. No disrespect. <laughs> Uh, let's remind people that the name of the book is Cary Grant, A Brilliant Disguise, written by Scott Iman, our guest today. We got to wind it down. I know, I know. We got to wind it down in a couple of minutes, but um, I, oh, I, I was, I was going to try to include this earlier when you when we were yeah. discussing Arsenic and Old Lace, which was my introduction to Cary Grant as a child. We used to, they used to project it at my summer camp on rainy nights. That was like the thing that was one of the couple of movies that we they had in the in their little library on 16 and, millimeter on 16 yeah, yeah for sure 16 millimeter yeah. and so that was my introduction so very early on i learned how to say <laughs> elaine i'm not a brewster i'm not a brewster <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh my god yes um i had to just sort of you know shoehorn that in somewhere um scott uh I guess this is the most, just to bring, sort of kind of wrap things up uh, in the next few minutes, but um, I mean, I know this is probably the most uh, obvious question, but why, why Cary Grant and, you know, why now? I mean, obviously you're interested in these 
iconic, human, maybe humanizing these iconic um, Hollywood figures. Was this just like a logical next? No, I, I, I we're well into the 21st century. By this time, basically everybody worth having a big book has had a big book written about them. So the question becomes, what can I do that's better? What can I do that's different with that person? Uh, because it's not going to, I, 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 there, there are books written about very tiny careers and I'm not interested in doing that because they're very tiny careers and they don't give me any room to, to, to stretch as a biographer, as a writer, as an amateur psychiatrist, what, all the things that go into the job. Uh, so, you know, when subjects come up, I basically read everything that's been written about that person between our covers. And if I think there's a really good book, I don't do it. It's as simple as that. I thought Cary Grant was singularly unfortunate <laughs> in, in, in uh, the biographers that chose to write about him. Uh, they were either uh, just just completely sleazy or uh, uh, all thumbs, all thumbs. And he was a very dexterous actor and a very dexterous personality and a very slippery personality. And I thought I could bring something to the table that hadn't been done, egocentric, though that may sound. Uh, but I went to the same thing with John Wayne when I did John Wayne. There's, there were half a dozen books on John Wayne. And if I thought one of them was definitive, I wouldn't have done it, frankly, uh, because I have no desire to be redundant. But, and also at this stage in my life, why waste three or four years of my fast ebbing life on doing something that has already been done? You know, so if I can't do it better, I don't, I don't do it. If I don't think I can do it better, I don't do it. Simple as that. To ask, you know, the were you surprised or were you aware? I mean, I was always aware, as I said at the beginning, that you know, uh, Cary Grant dabbled in, uh, in taking acid and the work of Dr. Janiger, mm -hmm. uh, supervising these acid trips. But I mean, it, it, it he took he, it wasn't like a singular experience he did it for years he wanted oh, yeah. and canon yeah. to do it it was it was almost obsessional well it was the it was the answer for his issues he yeah tried psychotherapy he didn't like it it didn't work for him it doesn't work for everybody it was too slow he didn't want to devote the next 15 years of his life you know to it and i think he was looking for some shortcut and so he was willing to try it and it for him it worked uh and it, it enabled him to realize that Archie Leach had a lot of problems. Cary Grant didn't particularly have a lot of problems, not right. really. And he had to start trying to become, to, to, to not let Archie Leach's problems overwhelm Cary Grant's life. And for some reason, acid helped him do that uh, and enabled him to integrate those two people into a more coherent whole. But I think the acid only, LSD only begins the process that is completed when he quit show business. I think it was quitting the movie business that really completed the integration of his personality because he could relax. He had all the money he could ever spend. He finally had that, that financial security, which was a struggle for him, but he felt secure financially. He no longer had to worry about being caught out, which I think was always in the back of his mind. You know, There's that wonderful quote from Delbert Mann who directed That Touch of Mink that he thought that Grant, in his mind, the clock would strike 12 and the coach would turn into a pumpkin and he'd be Archie Leach again. And I think that was, I, I think that was a very perceptive remark. Yeah. Uh, I think that was an issue for him in the back of his head because no matter, when you come from what he came from, there's always that possibility that could happen again. If it happened once, it could happen twice, you know? And, uh, but when, once he quit show business, he could relax. He had the money, he had the child. He always wanted desperately, uh, that he could always relate to because partially, I think he wanted to give a child the childhood he hadn't had. You know, he wanted to live the, his, the childhood he wished he'd had through her. Yeah. You know, and, and, and have, have that, that refracted joy that he'd never been able to experience as a child. Cause he was going to vaudeville houses or trying to avoid going home. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and, and, and he becomes, he only really becomes Cary Grant at the end of his life when he's not making movies anymore, when he starts taking time with people and as you say, mentoring people, which he hadn't particularly done when he was a big movie star, he starts, he really starts taking time with people and, and listening to other people's issues 
when he quits the movie business. And that's fascinating. It made him a better person, (laughs) basically. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when uh, Warren Beatty comes over and tries to convince him to be in Heaven Can Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had zero interest. He had zero interest in making more movies. Yeah. Uh, well, he's been I, in the business for. If you look at if you look at a, if you look at the whole totality of when he quit and what happens after he quits, it's understandable. And he's been in he the had business. Nothing left to prove. And he was working since he was a teenager, so he had sure, actually sure. worked far more than most. Uh, and there are actors who walk away. Yeah. Sean Connery walked away. Gene Hackman walked away. There's probably more. Should be more actors that walk away. Gene oh, yeah. to drive a stake through their hearts to get an actor to quit. You know, <laughs> but he walked away, and I, I that that. Earn me, earns a lot of respect, I think. Yes. Uh, I got to wind this down now. I'm sorry. I apologize because I, we barely scraped the surface, uh, truthfully. But um, it was such a pleasure to read the book and to talk to you, Scott. Thank oh, you. great talking Thank to you guys. You. Lovely. I yeah, we'll do it again. I like a good so. tennis match, you know? I, ma- I mentioned at the top, too, it's, aside from learning so much about Cary Grant, there are so many funny and memorable uh, anecdotes, Mel Brooks, uh, there's a great story about North by Northwest. Hitchcock plays a joke on him and has Martin Landau. Has That's funny. That's put, funny. Puts Martin Landau in the same suits, secretly has him go to the tailor uh, to, to bug Cary Grant. I, there's so many. I, I love the story, but the eve, the eve of his, the morning of his marriage to Diane Cannon, he's upset that she's got gaudy nail polish on yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a piece of work, piece of work. On the so and, on the downside. and then courtesy of Susan Lloyd, the granddaughter of Harold Lloyd, who pops up very uh, through TCM and uh, is in the book, um, uh, it, Cary Grant running around in caftans. Yes. It's another priceless <laughs> story. The visual, as they say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got to say thank you again. And uh, oh. I oh, hope thank you, this, Adam. Uh, thank you, Eliana. This. this was fun. This was fun. Anytime. Oh, Happy plan. to come on and talk to you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations. Yeah, we'll Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. All righty. Take care, guys. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. So long. Bye-bye. Bye now. I, I'm so sorry. I realize I have a 12 o'clock. In a... That's okay. It was perfect. Okay, good. Okay. good. Bye, hon. Thank, thank you. you. Love you. I hope Bye-bye. it was fun. Fantastic. I thought it was good. It was fantastic. Oh, you were good. great. Right. I put my hair down now. <laughs> <laughs>